All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, especially welcome folks I haven't seen before. Really great to see you. And uh, welcome to old friends on the path here together. This is a San Francisco Dharma Collective. It is an entirely volunteer run center, which means that we are literally existing within generosity. Just such a beautiful way to kind of settle in here. Um, the generosity of this center is founded upon the premise that we need each other to wake up on this path. I mean, we need each other for everything, right? But we need each other. Like, it is so awesome to have a personal practice and sit at home. There are innumerable amazing Dharma books, and you can find a YouTube channel for any type of practice you want. But when we practice together, there's something so different. Right. We're able to listen and reflect. We can kind of feel and hear and sense how these teachings come to life. So just a reminder of, of why we're here together. And we have been making our way through. I've taken quite a long um, I would say almost like a footnote. We'd ha we've had about a chapter long footnote on the Satipatthana Sutta. So we've been making our way through this book, Old Path, White Clouds, which is the historic life of the Buddha and such a beautiful book and a way to understand through storytelling what it was like to find awakening in a single lifetime. And it's indeed full of many magical and beautiful moments because when you see clearly when awakening is present, everything becomes quite beautiful. Um, that clarity brings so much calm to the mind that every moment is kind of worth cherishing. But there's also a lot of difficulties the Buddha faces, and not just, you know, in terms of going literally against the stream of society, but we also learn about, you know, the Buddha and his dad and his dad's attachment issues. And we learn about the conflicts and the Sangha. And so it's just such a rich book to get the relational field and just the life story of the Buddha. And we have paused for the last couple of weeks because the Buddha gives, you know, the entire um, story is made up of like suttas or little teachings. But we paused because one of the most essential suttas, especially in the life of the Buddha, I mean, there's been so many teachers since the Buddha who've enhanced and enriched and expanded these teachings, but potentially one of the most important teachings in the life of the Buddha is the Satipatthana Sutta. And this is the four foundations of mindfulness. So we've gone through um, the first two. Don't worry if you weren't here, we will cover them. Um, they are in some ways cumulative. And tonight we'll be practicing with the third foundation of mindfulness. And I find this one so interesting and so relevant probably because I have a very active and busy mind. Anybody else? Yeah, I think it's like, you know, some folks know in the Eastern traditions, come on in, welcome. Um, some folks know in Eastern traditions that uh, kind of high energy in the mind is called lung. So it's this specific condition of the modern world. We have a lot of lung or kind of high energy into the head centers and there are many ways to help us settle into the body and start to feel some of that high wind or high lung energy dissipate or find its natural space. But this one or this approach that we are working on tonight is just bringing our attention directly towards the busyness of the mind. And one of the most beautiful metaphors that I love in practice around working with the mind is finding the stillness in the motion. Or finding the stillness of our awareness that always exists amid the motion and the movement of the mind. Does that resonate for anyone? I know the movement resonates, but what about that idea of stillness? that it's also there. Uh, I, I'm sure I've shared this metaphor that kind of describes the stillness amid the movement or within or around permeating, which is there's a way that it's described by Alan Wallace, one of my root teachers, as like a hawk that's, you know, facing the wind. 
And if you've ever noticed the hawk that's facing the wind at Twin Peaks, you can see this like almost every evening. And the hawk, the wind is just rushing past it, rushing past it. But the hawk is finding this stillness, right? It's looking for its prey and it's kind of still. So it's not as though there isn't movement, but there's a stillness within that. Um, such a, a beautiful metaphor. And, and I do think one that helps encourage us and invite us into finding the stillness of the mind. And it's interesting uh, in the context of teaching and uh, a number of other settings, people are often asking me, do we really need stillness? Can we like do this practice without stillness? Anyone ever feel that way? Yeah, I mean, and it's awesome to do mindfulness of walking and to apply mindfulness throughout activities. I um, rode my bike here and I find that to be very helpful to like settle in and get clarity and I can apply mindfulness if I'm riding my bike. But there's something about the stillness that we consciously take on through mind and body that's that's different. It's so great and doesn't kind of diminish the experiences we can have that may be like visionary or ecstatic and indeed kind of spacious through dance, through singing, through other forms. But the stillness, the simplicity of stillness. There have not been scientific studies, so I can only say this from my own hunch. My guess is it's just incomparable. You don't get to shortcut your way to the benefits of stillness. There is not a medication. There is not a um, kind of a cheat sheet. Like stillness is cultivated and has very unique qualities. So that's my huge upsell on stillness. <laughs> We're going to try it out for ourselves. Um, but what I'd like us to do is do a couple experiments before we go into the practice. I think it's... Um, I think it can be a little challenging to, um, in the course of the practice, get that flavor of movement and stillness. And especially when we, we talk about the movement of the mind, um, there's a couple, a couple different ways that movement can happen or that we can notice movement in our mind. So we can experience the motion of our mind through grasping. So, for example, um, on my bike ride here, the kind of grasping um, that I might experience, I can, I definitely saw, bless you, uh, a lot of different people walking by or moving by, especially I went down Valencia, so like so many people. And it's one thing to notice that people are moving by. But the grasping is when it's like, oh, I like that shirt. I wonder where she got that shirt. <laughs> That's the like desire grasping right and I don't know if you all notice that there's some thoughts in the mind where even if you're trying to focus you're just like hopping along you're like oh that's nice I like that one and then there was also maybe you know if there was a for example not that this happened but it actually did uh there's a bicyclist like you know in the middle of the bike lane who's like you know has their um headset on and can't hear anything so I, I both notice them and I don't like them Right. So a different kind of grasping. And the same thing happens in our thoughts. And both of them, if we're really honest with ourselves, are extremely attractive. Like we enjoy those thoughts about something pleasurable, but we're also captivated by like the worry, right? By the catastrophe, by like what next could go wrong. So I want us to try that kind of motion. So no need for a formal sitting right now, but just if you bring your attention inward. And we'll start by kind of calibrating, what does it mean to observe our mind in this third stage of the Satipatthana Sutta, mindfulness of mind. We're applying concentration and insight to our own mind. So notice and just give it a try, like what is the mind like right now? Does it feel busy, bright? Does it feel heavy or tired?
And the mind isn't just what's behind the eyes or between the ears. This is the space of our awareness. And then we'll give ourselves this little practice of, is there something you're looking forward to? That could be even like a snack after this class or maybe something coming up over the weekend. And can you intentionally bring to mind this thing you're looking forward to and notice the movement of the mind? Notice how long it kind of stays in mind before it dissipates, maybe becomes less exciting or interesting. Notice the residue or the wake behind this desirable thing or event or experience. And then consider something you feel kind of worried about. Could be someone in your life, could be a situation with work, school, kids, family. And there might be many, but see if you can just bring one to mind. Just think about, I am worried about, and again, notice the movement of the mind. What shifts, what changes? what populates, proliferates. <laughs> and seeing if it naturally dissipates or if there's energy with it. And then we're gonna practice this shift from kind of being completely in this thought to leaning back from this thought. So what would it mean to bring space around this thought or feeling or experience that we're bringing to mind? And then a couple breaths in the body, just feeling our presence here in this moment. And gently, without shifting from this attention and awareness to the space of awareness, blinking eyes back open into the room. So curious from folks, what did you notice? And if it's if it folks in this room, if they don't mind dragging the mic to them so our friends at home can tell, and if anyone at home wants to ask, raise, raise a little hand or otherwise. No, anyone, what did you notice? Well, I have to admit to the fact that the only reason I can show up here every Wednesday night and sit still is because I rode my bike mm -hmm. from the train to my house, dropped off my bike and hiked over here. I tried biking here, but the problem that I have is 
is getting home because after I've practiced and I've been all relaxed, wow. then to get on my bike and, you know, get into a headwind and it's like eh, yeah. not happening. Yeah. So I just, I Uber mm -hmm. home. So, right. and I found myself having this simultaneous experience of, I both look forward to my Uber and I dread oh, my Uber. So they were both the grasping so, over and against. Yeah. Hmm. So it was very interesting. And did you notice, you know, again, this idea of movement of the mind, it's so unusual, right? It's not tactile. Like if I move this, there's a physicality. It, was there a sense of the movement of the mind? <sighs> fidgety fidgety okay yeah great thank, thank you. you yeah anybody else notice this kind of movement of the mind or was it it's okay if it just felt really busy a lot of things but was there a sense of you know it's like i i think of it as like you know there's that delicious smell and it's like our whole body moves towards it or if there's a not delicious smell it's like oh, my body moves away from it Anybody have that sense of movement in their mind? Can you hear me from here? Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, I get the sense of like when we were, when you were talking about something that we're anticipating, that's looking forward to, I was literally felt my mind going forward. Mm -hmm. Since my my that forward motion. Um and when you talked about asked us to bring to mind something that we're worried about or concerned about, I felt this it, that forward motion stopped hmm. and it all just sort of went down hmm. to the rest of me you know like this physical yeah. sense of dropping down hmm. into my shoulders and chest so it was very good noticing it was odd yeah <laughs> it, it you know and again i think um you've probably noticed this jimmy in practice over time but we our thoughts are not all the same. It's not like that cartoon thought bubble every time. They have a different velocity. They have a different shape. They kind of move. Some of them are quick. Some of them are slow. It's really interesting to notice that. And what, what I felt when you were describing your thoughts was like one was creating the, like the density and heaviness, right. right? And there's the, it's just very interesting. These, <clears throat> these movements of the mind. Yeah. And did anybody notice that the worrying was like a bit more sticky or dense? Anybody notice that? Yeah, for me, for sure. I mean, okay, who here noticed the enjoyable thing was more easy? Okay, that's a good personality test for the room. <laughs> right. um, and I think it, it can change a little bit to bit, but I myself, you know, I'm, I'm such a planner that makes me feel safe. So like 90% of my meditation grasping is like, is planning, right? And it's just so compulsively compelling, even on retreat. I plan what my next retreat will be. I'm like, this is good. I got to do this more. Why not have another free weekend? It's like just crazy, right? But it's this habit of mine. That's why we call these not who we are, but like often these habits of our mind. And again, with the Satipatthana Sutta, with the mindfulness, it's not just noticing. That's cool. That's a really cool practice to notice your thought makes you feel dense or your thought makes you feel movement. It's the concentration and the insight, recognizing, wow, my thoughts, like, they are of this. They are for that. And it helps us kind of dissolve them a bit, become a little bit less important and essential when we kind of catch on to ourselves, like, oh, planning again, right? And labeling is a practice many folks in the Theravadan tradition are familiar with, with in addition to watching the movement, we would say like, yeah, planning, planning, plan. I had to get specific on my labeling. It was more like planning meals, planning trips, planning friends I want to get in touch with, right? So we can really kind of 
get onto ourselves and, and recognize what the mind is doing. And not because thinking is bad and not because we're going to get rid of it, but we want to make it slightly less compelling, right? Just slightly less compelling. So, right, if I'm there at the stoplight on Valencia, can I just be for that moment with the trees that are undulating and moving, like the people who are painting a mural, the other biker, you know, not none of it taking all of my attention, none of it making me go off into a fantasy of, I wonder where they're headed and I wonder what they like. And, I, you know, just letting it be and resting in that stillness. That's the goal of, of this particular practice of the mindfulness of the mind. So one other aspect of the ways that we can get really um, pulled away from awareness and spacious awareness is distraction. So it's one thing to feel that like pull of like, ooh, I, I kind of like this and I am enjoying thinking about this and I, and I don't really like that. Distraction is when we just get like completely carried away. They're similar, um, but they're often described when we're observing our mind, we're looking at the difference between what we're enjoying and feeling pulled towards and, you know, this natural thought that arises that we kind of like or don't like versus something that kind of is like, it's almost like a runaway train of distraction for us, which easily could have happened in that short practice we did. Did anybody find themselves just like, yes, completely <laughs> in a fantasy, right? So you've at that point, even like lost a little bit of the meta awareness that, oh, I'm enjoying this thought. It's just the, the mind movie. Sometimes I think that's a good way to describe it where you're in it as though it is happening. Um, you know, when you're experiencing or watching a movie and you forget you're watching it, you're just right. The sus suspended disbelief that it's happening to someone else. So we're really interested in observing these different qualities of movement. So then what was it like, or was it possible to do that shift from really being in the thought to the leaning back? Anybody find that possible? Yeah. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, but in a really interesting way. Yeah. Because I, I had the opposite experience where, um, I, I, I don't experience the mind moving. I experience stuff moving through the mind. Mm. It's like you, it's like an area of the ocean. And there's like fish going through. Mm. Sometimes they just like get stuck mm. and they're like hanging out. And one thing that happened for me was at the beginning, the mind was very empty because I'm, it's been a long day. Mm. Uh, the mind is dull. Oh, and, and yeah. so, it, but it still felt like larger than the thoughts. Mm -hmm. So I can see the thoughts or space around the thoughts. Oh. And then, the flip side of what you described happened where the thought got larger than the mind. Yes. And so it was like, the thought is so much bigger than the mind. I can't see space around it. Yeah. And then the mind kind of gets lost. Yeah. So it's almost like if there's this area of ocean, then like just a whale came through, <laughs> there's no space around it. Yeah. Yeah. A beautiful description. Yeah. And I think, you know, what's interesting, the working hypothesis of this practice is that, behind the whale, right? Or as you're, as I'm at the stoplight, that that space of our mind is naturally still. And that's like, it's a hard sell for a lot of folks, right? Like you're like, not my mind. <laughs> my mind is not naturally still. And I'm curious when you feel that spaciousness um, or that sense of the mind having some greater capacity than thoughts, is there something like stillness? Is that a way you could describe it or see it? Yeah. And I think it is, it feels like there's, there's currents, but it does feel the, the more I zoom out, the, the more still it gets, Wonderful. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. And I like that idea of the zooming out. It's almost like we get the more perspective, the less the turbulence seems upsetting, right? Even if there is like surface turbulence, we zoom out, we zoom out. Oh, well, it's just a natural pattern, right? It isn't everything. Um, 
And I do think, you know, some of the words that we can use as like synonyms or analogies with stillness, you know, I think of peace, right? Is there a, is there a sense that our own mind is peaceful? Is our own mind, I mean, the last, especially couple months, I've been, we've been talking a lot about spaciousness. So spaciousness, when we consider spaciousness, feels like stillness is a quality within that, right? Again, these are all abstract, I know, and um, I'm not using abstraction to be cool and philosophical. I really think it matters to have these conceptual qualities, right? And again, it's just like the fingers pointing at the moon, right? I'm pointing at stillness, but it's I'm not actually creating stillness. So I'm giving you all the places to look, and then hopefully that is something that you can see or feel or know. So questions, we're gonna, we're gonna do a practice with this, but I feel like it's, it's really easy for me to say, find the stillness of your mind, um, but very hard to actually, yeah, even know where to look. So any questions? Yes, please. I think one of the, um, um, the thing of like, I feel going towards and moving away from, but it feels like that there's a, like a lot of like really disturbing imagery. Mm. That's the sort of the busyness of my mind. And yeah. it almost feels like it feels like the, so those thoughts both feel really um, sticky. It's kind of like, and really repelling. It's kind of like if you see an accident and somebody's lying there and it's like, there's this kind of, Invasive imagery. Um, yeah, it's aversive, but it's also fascinating. It's also sort of pulls me in, pulls me out. Yeah. And it feels like at that point, there's sort of no, um, there's no sort of no space. It feels like it's kind of just a sort of a binary thing. And I'm trying to figure out like, what would be like a stillness in a place where around dramatic or disturbing imagery or thoughts or whatever is it sort of in a place where you just like, um, I don't know, the currents feel like they're really, really strong yeah. in both directions. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts about what stillness looks like in yeah. the face of that kind of stuff. Yeah, such a good question. Thank you. Yeah, and I think it's been really wonderful in the context of um, contemporary meditation practices becoming integrated into many more spaces to think about kind of trauma-informed meditation and mindfulness and when we have that kind of what's called clinically like invasive imagery or unbidden, right? Like not, we're not asking for it. It's arriving. Definitely a hallmark of a traumatic experience, but we all have it. It's not, you know, trauma is a, a broad term that can happen for us just seeing um, from a movie, right? From a life event. And some of the, you know, the simple instructions is you definitely don't want to effort when that's happening. So if this image is arising, you're not trying to force it away because that can kind of strengthen the resistance and make it feel more challenging or difficult. Um, and then the instruction is to, there's kind of a couple different instructions and one can be like, is there anywhere that feels like you can be soft with it? And that might just be not trying to make it go away. Like, can I soften with this? Can I make this? Okay, like I'm not focusing on it as in perpetuating it, but I'm also not um, trying to push it away. Can I just be with this? That can be also still too much. So then another option is finding a neutral place in the body, elbows, maybe knees, and kind of oscillating and giving yourself some time to just be there might be in a place of the body that feels neutral and then coming back to the mind. Um, and then a third is to like quite literally more deliberately find a healthy place of distraction. So that might be opening your eyes. For me, I can see that Buddha and just letting myself see the Buddha and then coming back to the practice just to give ourselves options. So thank you for that question. Yeah. And I do find um, after a very full day with a lot of, emotional content and that doesn't even mean like you're you know working as a frontline healthcare provider that is definitely true but even the emotional content of being with people all day right there's so many interactions that we are digesting and processing when we finally sit down even if you're in front of a screen all day 
if you have some meetings with people, there is emotional energy, right? Overperforming, suppressing, right? And sometimes when we get still, that stuff bubbles up. Often it bubbles up in order to be kind of released, but sometimes it bubbles up and it just is like stuck. I don't know how to better describe it. And so then it might need some help to be released. But I think it's really helpful to have this sense that this is not something attacking my mind. This is not something that shouldn't be here. Like, actually, this is coming up. It needs to be released. And that attitude towards it can also be really helpful. Yeah, no, great question. Yeah. Eve, we oh. have uh, an online. Okay, hi. Hey. Nice to see um, you. Yeah, you too. Uh, thanks. I um, just wanted to add, this is so closely related to a practice I was doing earlier today. Um, it's not exactly the same, but it might be helpful for some others. Um, I was sitting and there was a lot of noise and I started trying to see if I could look for the stillness underneath the noise, mm. sort of find that place. And then it was like, oh, I wonder if I could do this with like visual stimulation, sort of mm. look for the stillness behind that. And then I was thinking about what you were saying about being on the corner and with the trees, kind of like there was movement, but it was a place of stillness in like mm -hmm. actual movement. Um, so, um, I don't know. I imagine if I continue to cultivate this, that maybe it'll allow me to find that place of stillness in sort of any circumstances. Yeah. Um, that would be the hope. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderfully said. And I think, you know, one of the goals in our practice with mindfulness of the mind is to try to you know, establish an ability to have no preference for what arises in our mind. It's really hard. We have a lot of preference, right? But you were describing hearing the sound instead of being like, oh, when is it going to stop? Like, what's the stillness around it? Um, and, you know, I, I think our own thoughts, it's just, it's such a cool place to practice. And it's so beneficial, that's where we live, right? We live in our own minds with our thoughts. And what I find so important to, to remember is that our, our thoughts are not real. Such a fundamental thing to like see and to know, right? And part of the mindfulness of the mind is to see directly like, wow, I'm in this mind movie in like a horrible place, but actually I'm sitting at the Dharma center. Like, wow, like I'm not there. And being able to kind of you know, cut through or see how much our thoughts create a reality that is not actually here right now can be very helpful. You know, we know from some research, I really like us to replicate these studies because now they're getting a bit old, but some research that, you know, is asking people many times a day how they're feeling. Um, and what we find is most people, most of the time are not focusing on what they're doing. They're focusing completely somewhere else, and it's not somewhere pleasant. It's not like, here I am at work, but I'm imagining myself in Tahiti, right? It's like, here I am at work, and I'm imagining like something that's annoying to me about work or home, but not actually doing what I'm doing. And what's so interesting is when people are focusing on what they're doing, they also report being happier. Unless, of course, it's like in the moment, acutely difficult. But the majority of our lives, we are not here. We are in this kind of mind stream. And this is not to say that we should never allow our thoughts to kind of proliferate and, you know, create these wonderful, honestly, like wonderful scenarios and experiences that can come from creative mind wandering so beautiful right and we wouldn't want to kind of police our mind wandering at all times but so much of it we are just have no idea we're mind wandering and we're losing like so much of our um kind of clarity and focus and often contributing to feelings of dis-ease by letting our mind wander so much so are you motivated yeah, let's get on to our mind. So I know we've been sitting. If folks want to stand up for just a minute before we sit for longer. 
pillows and blankets. It's not perfect temperature in here, but you want anything. We're going to do the practice now. We are. Yes. Feel free to sit the Zafu if you would like. You are also welcome to lay down, but if you snore, I ask your neighbor to wake you up. <laughs> I have some preference for not that sound. So when we're finding a meditation posture, it's really nice to find the balance, these two essential qualities of, of mindfulness, the sense of ease and relaxation and presence and a sense of vividness and uprightness. So this vividness and uprightness is the kind of the brightness of our awareness, the clarity of our awareness. And we also want to feel a sense of ease. That ease allows us to more easily be here and be present. <clears throat> and so to start us off with that sense of ease and presence, we can put just a hand or two on the heart, over the heart center. And this simple gesture can actually create a, a biological response of feeling held and cared for. So we could take a moment to support ourselves in practice by just calling in or bringing in a sense of deep care for ourselves. And recognizing our presence here will make us more available and loving for other beings in our life. Inviting them here too, part of our motivation for practice. And just seeing if for one or two more breaths, we can connect with the sense of being held, being supported by ourselves and by all the beings who've made it possible for us to be here. It's really feeling that sense of we are here because of so many beings known and unknown. And then gently releasing our palms folded in your lap or just resting open, flat on the thighs. And then inviting on the inhale, our shoulders to come up to our ears and then exhaling our shoulders down our back. And twice more, inhaling up, exhaling back. And one more time. And see if we can sense a bit more uprightness with that, almost as though our, our spine and our neck and shoulders and head could feel a lifted quality. Feeling the dignity of our meditation posture. And just feeling this body as a perfect vessel for practice. Through all of our sensory portals and this ability to have strength and stability in the back. And tenderness, openness, ease through the front.
And continuing to settle into the body and inviting this quality of stillness in the body. Feeling the stillness of the body amid the mo mo movement and motion, the motion and the movement of our subtle energies in the body. Settling into our breath, finding the natural rhythm of our breath, not forcing it in any way. And once again, engaging with this first aspect of the Satipatthana Sutta, breathing in, knowing we are breathing in, and breathing out, knowing we are breathing out. His knowing of the breath is not conceptual, it's felt in the body. This knowing is not a thinking about the breath. The knowing is a feeling, a deep experiencing of the breath. So often we are breathing in and breathing out, unaware that we are breathing in and breathing out. So for a couple more moments, experiment with this very generous and curious attention to our breath. And of course, the mind will get distracted and slip away. And at this point, no problem. Not needing to observe it too closely, but just returning to the breath. And just subtly shifting our attention on the breath to feeling and knowing that the whole body is breathing. So breathing in, feeling the whole body breathing in and breathing out feeling the whole body breathing out. And continuing our just preliminary settling in and stillness. We invite the stillness to our mind. In this case, the stillness of really allowing and inviting ourselves to be here, present. Stilling our mind so we aren't reaching and grasping ahead to the future. 
stilling our minds so we aren't leaning back to the past and reliving this invitation to be fully here in this body, in this breath, in this moment. It's okay if the mind is really busy. It's okay if the mind feels really dull or lethargic. And for just a couple more moments, seeing if we can feel the sense of breathing in the body and inviting ourselves with each breath to be here. <clears throat> and taking a moment here before we begin the next phase of practice to connect with our intention our intention or motivation to practice is considered the most essential part of our entire time together it's our intention that really guides us, our intention that whether or not we feel tired or overwrought, the intention and strengthening the intention is the definition of our practice. So we can consider a single word or phrase that maybe captures why we are here together. And this intention always infused not only with our own well-being, but the recognition of collective well-being as an essential piece. See if what a word or phrase that can stir the heart. Our motivation or intention is it's like stoking the flame of our heart. So we remember why we're really here. Remember all the beings we would love to support. All the ways we'd love to transform and be more available. Imagining the possibility of freedom. Freedom from suffering, delusion. See if that can feel real. That can feel palpable. And then allowing the intention or motivation to recede and settle around us, we shift to this practice of mindfulness of the mind. For some, doing this practice with eyes slightly open can be helpful. Uh, that could also feel distracting, so you can experiment. With the eyes slightly open and a soft gaze, we are breaking down the barrier between the mind in here and the world out there. Mm. And in this <clears throat> simple practice, we notice what arises in the space of the mind. 
what are the movements of the mind? The primary focus is in the awareness and spaciousness of the mind. Observing the space of the mind and everything that arises within it without grasping, without distraction, allowing all events, thoughts to arise and just naturally dissipate. No need for them to stop, just to not get caught up. It doesn't matter how many times we do get distracted or find ourselves grasping. Just returning over and over to the space of the mind. And maybe starting to feel a bit of the stillness of that space of mind. can be very helpful to have a sense of pliancy within the body. If the mind feels really active, see if you can invite more relaxation in the body. If it feels like there's no break in between the thoughts, again, no problem. Every time you notice, just taking one breath and reconnecting to awareness.
You can always come back to your breath and following the breath. If you need to reset your focus and attention. Observing the thoughts is sometimes described as observing the clouds. And the mind and awareness is the sky. So bringing our attention and awareness to that which is unmoving, unchanging, hosting all of our experience. Even if it feels remote, consider the possibility of awareness being a place of stillness and peace. That which is always already here. And that which, even if we aren't quite noticing it, may start to come into the mind stream and the body, start nourishing our sense of presence. Considering that awareness is not just an awareness of the body and mind. Our awareness is unbounded. Our awareness is above us and below us. Our awareness surrounds us on every side. I'm feeling the spaciousness of that awareness. Bringing our attention and awareness more fully back into the body, regathering our attention and awareness into the breath. And taking a couple slower inhales and longer exhales. Inhaling and counting up to four. Exhaling, releasing even longer. Even though the bell will ring, see if you can maintain a sense of the stillness of awareness as we start to move our mind in more deliberate and focused ways.
Thank you for your practice. So, questions, reflections? How's the stillness of your mind? Oh, I think Jimmy got it. <laughs> I can see it. <laughs> yeah, please. Do you mind using the mic? We can drag it over to you. Thank you. I always feel like I should sing. Yeah, I know. It is the lounge singer. And that would disturb that would disturb everyone's peace of mind. Yeah, I had a, an Alan Wallace question. I really liked the image you had about mm -hmm. stillness in motion and that image of kind of the hawk hovering in the wind. It's very beautiful. But my question was this. Alan Wallace, I know, has, uh, talked about the relationship of equipose to insight and this is my crude understanding this is from the balance in the mind but he talked about how some people think that you can use insight meditation to find balance but that's backwards right that you can't you actually until you're in a place of balance you can't really meditate <laughs> very well yeah or productively but i guess my question was that concept of stillness in motion mm. seemed like it might be related to that in some way of maybe getting to a place if stillness means balance of a sort of quiet balance still place that you kind of need that as a as a platform mm -hmm. to it's very hard to meditate if you're not in that space i think was his point but you, you're more familiar with yeah. it so I, I was just is there a connection between those it's, yeah that's a question and then wait sorry before can i ask you about your experience in the practice uh i don't know if i can answer but sure yeah like um did you notice yeah like when there was a presence of stillness what did you notice or if there was a presence of stillness what did you notice well i think I guess sort of a two-part answer. One is that when I read Balance of the Mind earlier, it seemed to correspond in that when I'm in a more frantic, uncommon, uncalm place, my meditation doesn't work. Mm. Like I can't really do it productively mm. unless I'm actually... So it, it, his sequencing seemed to make some sense. Tonight, what I found was just sort of focusing on, at least at the beginning, that image of sort of the hawk in the wind it's just an image that promotes sort of that kind of a state of equipose or calm that seemed like it seemed like it worked well tonight by sort of starting there okay yeah um i'm not sure if that's yeah. responsive but and like phenomenologically which is so hard but like what i wouldn't use that word but yeah okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> like what does the mind like feel like it's so hard but i'm just curious you know that i think it's good for us to like stretch a little like what was the mind like experientially i'm not quite sure how to answer that cool. other, other than that the image seemed to yeah correspond with the kind of state of balanced equipose that that really led to a, what seemed like a very um rewarding productive meditation session yeah I, i'd like more of that yeah good. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> craving yeah it's a it's a maybe a wholesome craving um can i wait and answer this question first because i'll totally lose lose track here um yeah there's a couple parts of your question so Alan, um, Alan Wallace, just for those who don't know, is a is an author, scholar, teacher. I learned so much from him. So I feel like he's always um, kind of moving through me in the teachings. And um, can you remind me your name again? Paul. Paul. So what Paul was describing is, you know, Alan is always very um, strongly emphasizing that we develop shamatha or we develop an attentional practice before we start investigating and analyzing and that 
without an attentional practice, the rest is really shaky. It's like uh, building a house on sand dunes, AKA the marina, right? And then <laughs> it's just like always moving, right? And moving with our emotional content and moving with our thoughts because we actually don't have this basic foundation of shamatha, of attention. Um, that's true. And we are living in a time of possibly more frayed attention than ever. I mean, I know there's been a lot of epochs in history and it's impossible to uh, compare, but I do think sustained attention is even harder, like in my lifetime, right? Like there's so much more. I, um, I agree with that. And a lot of the the sequencing of getting into practice, settling body, speech, and mind in its natural state, that's all intended to help us kind of like settle in through body um, stability and the stillness. I think though, that most of us are not gonna achieve shamatha before we start meditating, right? And, and so we kind of are having to do both. I agree that in an ideal world, we would have mastered this kind of sense of stable attention and then move ahead. I think we can, it's interesting because almost every, pra I mean, all the foundations, these four foundations of mindfulness are shamatha attention practices. If we're observing our breath, if we're observing our body, if we're observing, you know, whether it's pleasant, unpleasant or neutral, if we're observing the mind, we're developing sustained attention. We're also getting some of the benefit of learning as we're doing this shamatha concentration practice, like, what are these thoughts? What are these preferences? So it's a little bit of both. And then um, there's something else. Oh, yeah. Um, well, like two things. I mean, one thing, and we did this at the beginning of our practice with the hands on the heart. I think for many of us, even if in certain contexts, we have sustained attention, being able to feel safe and at ease is going to allow us to practice and sustain. There's like almost like even before we can have an attentional capacity, we have to feel somewhat okay. And that's not easy. Not only not easy in an unfamiliar space where we don't all know each other, that's not easy anywhere, right, with ourselves. So I really feel passionate um, that we start to develop these capacities to feel aware of our own emotions, compassionate with our own experience, and that that settling in will allow the attention. Yeah. I think for me is that the connection suggests to me that sometimes like if on the cushion means we're kind of, we're already meditating, we're trying to, Yeah. that there are things that we can do off the cushion that will help yes and so like one tangible example is something like dukkha so if, if your mind is just filled with regrets it's just churning endless regrets of things you have done or not done that's the kind of stuff that you can actually work on off the cushion yeah. to make peace with so when you get on the cushion you can actually meditate yeah. as opposed to starting to meditate. And then what comes to you is like, do -ka, 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 and you're like, yeah. gee, this is not really feeling very good right now. Right. No, I mean, um, it's, so. it's our basic mental hygiene, right? Like how do we sit down into practice with like some good hygiene, right? We can't, we can't expect, um, ourselves to just overcome all the chaos in our life when we sit down, we can start. I mean, it's a lot of chaos we can't control, right? But the things of, you know, explicitly, you know, harmful conduct, you know, how we act in the world, that is like the most important part of our meditation practice. And that not only because it's embodying what we're here for, but because it influences whether we're able to sit down and another Alanism, which I love, which he says, to feel when we sit down to practice or we lay down at night, the bliss of blamelessness. I don't feel regret. I don't feel worry. I don't, I, I, I acted in a way in accordance with my values. Whew, feels good. Anybody have that today? Not me. Anybody here? Oh, good. Nice. Yeah. I started early, but I, I've tried to recover. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I just want to agree completely with what you said, Paul. It drives me kind of 
bananas when people say, oh, if you're agitated, you should go meditate. Well, if I were in a place where I could meditate, I wouldn't be agitated. <laughs> and I think it's kind of like what we were talking about earlier, uh, where, you know, get your activity out and then you can yeah. come to stillness. Yeah. But you used a term that I'm really curious about, mind stream. Mm. Could you say a little bit more about mind stream? Yeah, it's, you know, I don't even know who coined that term. Yeah, I, I could try to figure that out. I don't think it's a Thich Nhat Hong term. I think it's more contemporary, but just, I, it's like, it's a, again, like, another way to kind of point at the moon or to describe something that's indescribable, right? Like I'm asking Paul, describe your mind. He's like, yeah, <laughs> it's really hard to describe it. But there is this kind of almost like gestalt sense that our thoughts are like a stream, right? Like, and we are on the side of the stream sometimes, or we fall into the stream, right? And so I just like mind stream as, and it's just this constant moving thing sometimes you know there's a lot of there's sometimes like repeats right of course you know i was definitely when i caught myself in this meditation it really was planning i was like really we just <laughs> talked about that um but like that mind stream is like constantly just it's bubbling up and it's it's not wrong or bad like that is like it's, it's amazing we have probably survived to this amount of evolutionary air quotes progress um because we can think and we can plan and we can do things um so it's not bad or wrong but i do think there is a cultivated ability to let the stream be the stream and to not fall into it and that is something we really want to do yeah yeah thank you Anybody else questions? Yes, please. Hi, I'm Johan. Um, I'd like to share with you uh, my practice tonight. Um, so um, it's been a long time since I practiced in group. Mm. So I noticed that at first. Um, I was a little agitated and I stopped following my breath mm. and I've noticed something, there's an imagery that came to my mind, like being in the water, I spent some time in the water and going up the wave, going down the wave, mm. breathing in, breathing out and all of a sudden start calming me down. Mm. Um, Then the mind start wandering again, the thoughts, like clouds, and it's easy to get caught and follow them sometimes. Mm -hmm. Get caught in a story, yeah. in a movie, to remind yourself. Yeah. You know, this is not your story. Yeah. Just a story. Yeah. Your mind is throwing at you. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, bye. Come back. Yeah. And when you said to slightly open your eyes, mm. I tried it. And all of a sudden, something shifts mm. from me and my mind to realizing I was in presence of other being. Mm. And I could feel the energy. Mm. And I don't know where that came from. I had another image of a bunch of... Uh, to name more um, little drone hovering, trying to find the stillness mm. altogether. Mm. Uh, and then I find it easier to stay still. Mm. And the thoughts start passing by, uh, there'll be less thought. It was, I guess um, I felt more calm mm. and in control. Beautiful. Thank yeah. you. Can I ask you one more question? Please. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to say like this should happen, but it really can happen that our thoughts start to get less strong. Um, and so I was just curious, like, how did that feel qualitatively? Like, did it feel 
good. Did it, yeah. It, it felt great. Yeah. It, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, it felt great, of course. Um, I had realized that um, the mind, it's not my moving, it's the mind is still, the mind get caught by the thoughts. Yeah. Um, yeah, and um, oh yeah, I wanted to add, I, uh, I tried a few different things during the practice as breathing in some bright lights and trying to push the murky one down. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Well, yeah. Yeah. And I, um, little, uh, sneak preview. Um, I don't actually even think, uh, Cage knows this yet, but I'm on retreat next week with Chandra. Uh, we're going to be teaching together and I snagged us like such an amazing guest teacher, it's going to be online, unfortunately, but it's absolutely worth coming. It's, it's Ryan Redman. Some of you know who uh, is a co-teacher and he'll be teaching this next phase of mindfulness of the mind. And like, this is like what he lives for. And I want to share a quote of him um, when he is writing about what happens that when we really um, observe the mind, he says, um, Through observation and mindfulness of the mind, the movement of the mind subsides and awareness comes to rest. Experience of knowing a vast empty expanse can emerge. The thoughts don't cease, but we aren't lost in them. And you will become still in a fluctuating state in which you will experience joy like the warmth of a fire, clarity like the dawn, and non-conceptuality like an ocean unmoved by waves so beautiful so you will become still in an unfluctuating state in which you will experience joy like the warmth of a fire clarity like the dawn non-conceptuality like an ocean unmoved by waves this idea that the stilling of the mind and i know i don't want to kind of say this if this wasn't your experience yet, but just to kind of point towards what we see, you know, these ancient masters like Du Jum Lingpa describe this ability that we have to truly still the mind, that that is something possible, like that's within the realm of possibility. And that when we still our mind in this way, um, this says, is it Johan? Johan, Johan. like as Johan described, the thoughts can actually start to subside. They don't necessarily go away. And then we experience this, this sense of our own mind as that place we're always looking to be, that experience we're kind of seeking through so many other routes. Just find that incredibly inspiring. I definitely get glimpses of that. And I do find for myself with more regular practice, if I notice it once, I can know how to find my way back there. Um, which I think is is really encouraging. Um, and it can be really frustrating to not know that feeling. So I also want to recognize that. It's like, oh, that sounds great. <laughs> How do I do it? Um, and sometimes we just get lucky. Sometimes we're not even like practicing all the time. Sometimes just boom, like the right conditions, the right causes are there. And we can just feel that. Um, but I think it's so encouraging to hear from folks when they do have like a little taste or flavor of that. So thank you for sharing. Other questions? Yeah. I don't know if we can get that. Oh, yeah, good. Uh, um, a question. Um, not a question. Yeah, I, I got that. That was a beautiful meditation. So um, the stillness was palpable, you know, so dark, cool, mm. um, kind of expansive. And what I was noticing um, 
uh, when you asked to, you know, the, the instruction to open our eyes, I, I, at that point I wasn't there and that wasn't helpful for me. Yeah. But when I closed my eyes again, um, I'm not sure as I'm out here, how much you could hear the music of the recycling yeah. down the street. Yeah. So, uh, you know, at first, um, it was a little problematic and, and as I settled into the stillness, um, there was this fluctuation between like, like noticing it was kind of musical. It was like bells. It was like chimes. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to like reach out and be like, hold on to that. I wanted to record that. I wanted mm -hmm. to be out there with my iPhone recording the music of the street. Right. But then I noticed that I didn't, I didn't have to go out there. Yeah. Right. That right. Like my mind didn't have to grab it. Mm. Right. And then I was in this stillness mm. and then it was that it had transformed into something else. Mm. I wasn't hearing bottles and cans. I wasn't hearing cars. Yep. I wasn't hearing voices. I was just hearing sounds from this place. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that non-conceptual just kind of, joy with what was going on yeah. uh, that's that was that was happening for quite a while mm -hmm. and uh you know I, at some points I, I noticed that the air filter was on I just, <laughs> i'd completely missed that for a while but that was that was also musical mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah and mm -hmm. yeah you know like one more thing like some point like in the middle of it my mind wants to go out and like create an animation out of it like yeah. create a story around that yeah. But that reaching out for that, that was very momentary. Yeah. It was, it was just, it was a thought. It was a grad, and then it, it just came right back to this place. Thank Beautiful. you. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I love one thing I really picked up on in that description, both, you know, the the presence of that, that peace and that stillness. Um, and just how we can get that kind of phenomenological experience of our thoughts, right? Where you, you can see them arise and then, you know, so there's the sound, don't like the sound, like the sound, want to go outside, record the sound, right? It's amazing how quickly our thoughts emerge. And it's so cool to be able to kind of almost like that plume of smoke, you know, that's like circling around and winding its way. And I heard um, Muni, right? At one point that, that like sigh of the Muni breaks, you know, that and I like saw Muni and I thought Muni and my brother is here tonight. Thanks Tom for being here visiting in town. And I heard my brother say for Trey, you know, which is like our old bus, the 43. So it's like all the thing, you know, you can like start to really see the story and mind movie and then like coming back to stillness with it is like, ah, because the, the last part of what Ryan says is, like when we can experience this clarity, like the dawn and the non-conceptuality that we develop a yearning for this and that um, we start to believe that we are, we are like no longer able to bear being separated from that sense of stillness. And like we long for it. Right. Um, so thank you for that. Yeah, please go. Yeah. I just wanted to say, hearing you say that with your wonderful Spinal Tap t-shirt turned up to 11. <laughs> I really appreciated that. Um, I um, no, This conversation has helped me to possibly make sense of something, but um, near the end of the meditation, I experienced something there were a lot of thoughts and I, after you prompted it earlier, I started labeling them and that was helpful and kind of label and kind of have them swim away. But near the end, I, I had this thought. Um, and it was at first, it was this mental image about it's the last sentence of one of my favorite books, mm. which is this beautiful mental image of this goldfish mm. in a fish bowl at the end of the world with like a rainbow going through it. And I had this thought of like, oh my God, that's so clever. That's such a good, that reminds me of my mental image of my thoughts and all of that kind of stuff. And it was kind of having the thought and then the thought went away. But then what was interesting was the image kind of remained. Interesting. And I had this moment, I've been 
hearing you say the word non-conceptuality, and it was really interesting because the experience of the thought was super different than the experience of just the yeah. image itself. And the other thing that I was pondering is it's it's a mm. a trilogy of books that is like this thick that I've read twice. And it's the last sentence and that feeling of ending that journey. Like uh, for, for me, like that, that is, there's a particular stillness that comes from a book that like wraps up perfectly in that mm -hmm. way that I think as soon as I had that mental image, it just kind of loaded that mm. experience back in. Mm. So what, it was just, you know, it was momentary, but I was curious about that. Uh, I guess somewhere in my head was this idea of like either stillness is there's nothing. Yeah. And then there's the thought, but it was interesting to experience something that's clearly something like mm -hmm. a very clear, vivid mm -hmm. mental image. But there also wasn't a thought without grasping, without distraction, for for a time. Yeah, for a time. Yeah, <laughs> so beautifully described. And this is what I'm saying: like we are all first person scientists of our own mind. There is no scanner out there. There is nothing in the world that could describe what you're experiencing better than you. Like it is such a nuanced and subtle way that actually like our, our minds are totally amazing and there's so much subtlety and obviously we're like oh yeah i'm thinking like that's just so blunt and lame but like what you're describing and i think it's interesting um the way i haven't actually seen this i'm sure it exists in one of the many tomes of tibetan buddhism but what you're describing is that kind of um the non-conceptual and almost like the the internal language of imagery Mm. Right. So often we think in words, but there's actually an internal language that's that's images before we label them as words. Right. And we existed as a human species before language for a long time or images. Right. And so I think it's it's just I for me, like these kinds of insights, that's like the real motivation where we're like, like roll up our sleeves, like I want to meditate, like I want to know consciousness. Right. And that it, it truly is. There's like nothing more exciting and fascinating, but it's not just exciting and fascinating. It's actually doing the work of cleaning up the mind stream. Right. Because <clears throat> when we think about the mind stream, it's often polluted with just like so much worry and negativity and self criticism. And when we see it clearly and we can like watch it and observe it, it like it kind of like cleanses and purifies that mind stream. So it's, it's very encouraging. And it is interesting. Then you describe this other thing, which I have no idea about, which I think is so cool. You have one sentence, it's the end of the book. And then the whole book is like there in the mind stream, but it's not obviously the whole book. It's not paragraph by paragraph. It's like, where is that in our mind stored all this knowledge of this? Book? It's just very cool. Well, my question to you is going to be, but is the image, the image is also a thought. So why is one thought and the other thought, but Hearing you describe grasping. that, yeah, yeah, and hearing you describe that feels like it's more about um, more. What is the impact of different kinds of activity in there? Yeah, and I think it's like you know the next phase of this practice is starting to more get like looking at like what is the the exact nature of these experiences, whether it's like grasping or aversion, like what is it? But in this phase, we're really curious like can we have the image of the goldfish and the um end of the world and the rainbow can we even have the like beautiful chimes of the recycling sound and let them be just the sound just the image no preference no grasping no distraction so not making any of them wrong but really making them so bare that our awareness becomes more clear so you guys are awesome. Thank you. Wow. I could. Sure. Why not? If anyone really needs to leave, you can leave. But we're going to. Um, this is a great discussion. Um, somewhere I got a tickle in my throat. And then the tickle got worse. And then I started freaking out. And I'm like, I need to move. I can't move. I need to cough. I can't cough. I don't want to leave. And then I said to myself, I don't know exactly what it was. But, well, how about we try just calming down? Mm. I don't know what the exact words were, but then I kind of said something to myself and I said, okay. And then it just, psh, no more tickle, 
no more tracing thought, you know, racing thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. And was there some stillness, some peace there? No, there was no longer yeah. all the physicality. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 It went from blah, 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 yeah. blah, to the body and the mind both know stillness and it's just beautiful to like it's almost like you applied stillness from the mind to the body but the body can also do it to the mind like the stillness of the body can help the mind relax too so thank you yeah i love this thank you all so much really super rich um and again it's not just to nerd out on consciousness because like it's very cool but like what does this afford us on the path to awakening right it allows us to see what's in the way of that peace that we so deeply seek and that when we have that peace you know i I invite any of you who had an experience of peace tonight or stillness tonight, just to notice how it might change your interactions with yourself or others who live in your home, because it's not just about, you know, us, it is how we are available to others. Um, so let's take a moment on that to dedicate the merit of our practice here. We're just coming back into the breath and the body. And then symbolically, we do this offering where we consider anything that we have generated here tonight. We consider our thoughts, ideas, our effort as energy. And can we dedicate that energy to the greater purpose of our time here together? This consideration that our time here together could benefit all beings and that all beings could know peace and ease. All beings could be happy and free. And all beings could know belonging, safety. Thank you so much. Um, please support our center. You can do so uh, by finances, you know, all payment forms, but also you can do so by being a volunteer. Um, there are many volunteers in the room. Will you raise your hand? 